Welcome to episode 1 of My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. I am your host, you can call me T. And in this series, we're going to take a quick look at some of my favorite tropes that pop up in our favorite works of fiction. Now, what is a trope? Well, TVTropes.org defines a trope as a storytelling device or a convention, a shortcut for describing situations the storyteller can reasonably assume the audience will recognize. TVTropes.org will be the basis for this series, and no, I am not affiliated with them. And by the way, how are they not making videos like this? I don't know. But anyway, we're going to start with one of my favorite tropes, flanderization. Now what does this obviously made up word mean? Essentially it's when a single character trait becomes the character. It's named after Ned Flanders of The Simpsons and the changes that came into his character. It's generally thought of in a negative way, but it can make a bland character more interesting at times. For example, I think Eric Matthews on Boy Meets World became a lot funnier and more interesting when he went from being a pretty stock, standard older brother character to a goofy, less than smart, over the top kind of guy with a heart of gold. Now, one of the most infamous cases of flanderization comes from pretty much every character in Spongebob. For example, Spongebob's dizziness turned into a disturbing lack of awareness, to the point that you can't do anything but just feel angry at him sometimes. Patrick's lack of sense and smarts with occasional glimpses of brilliance turned into dangerous stupidity with glimpses of awareness that just make his actions seem malicious. Then you also have Squidward, Mr. Krabs, and Sandy who, over time, have had their traits turn into really just maliciousness again for them as well. Steve Urkel on Family Matters had his character turn from a pretty standard nerd kid character to a mad scientist who ends up lost in space at the end. Even Judge Judy got- hold up. Wait, wait, that's, that's Judge Judy. Judy, Judy, okay. Even Judge Judy got flanderized. Her snark and outburst got really popular and took over the show. There are far too many examples to name, but the one that stands out to me the most is Teen Titans Go. This is pretty much flanderization the show. Their roles and traits and quirks are all turned up to 11, and that is basically their new characters in the show. Now one could argue that since this is his own show, that this isn't really flanderization since this is just their take on these characters, but this is a direct follow-up with the same actors and with references back to the original show. This is essentially a sequel series, and of course, these are comic book characters first and foremost, so if nothing else, there's a flanderization of their characters there, even though of course it does seem to much more directly tie into the original cartoon. So yeah, there are exactly, uh, let me see. Uh, 16 bajillion more examples I could give you. So I'll just link to the page on TV Tropes and you can read up more on it on your own if you want to. Well, thanks for watching and I will see you in episode 2 of this series, which will be... I haven't decided yet. Alright, bye. Welcome to episode 2 of My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV, and today we're talking about lampshades. I guess you could say we're illuminating the truth about really? Real lampshades. Oh! Sorry. Specifically, we're talking about lampshade hanging, or lampshading. Now, what is that? Well, TVTropes.org will bring this to light. Stop it, it's not funny. And that says, essentially, that lampshading is more or less a writer's self-deprecating way of preemptively calling attention to something that might threaten the audience's suspension of disbelief. It's basically saying that what we're doing here is either so overdone or so blatantly impossible that we have to call attention to it ourselves so the audience doesn't. It's a lot like when people try to make fun of themselves so other people don't make fun of them. And it can work to great effect sometimes as a really funny joke. But other times it comes across as just a lazy excuse for laziness. You have to do it right pretty much. Take, for example, Yakko Warner's catchphrase of goodnight everybody. Every time he says this, this is the writers lampshading the fact that they just got away with probably a double entendre. Yakko seems to immediately expect to get taken off air every time he says it. Like, oh, whoops, that won't fly in a kid's show. Well, goodnight everybody. Now take a show that is known for having pretty much no consistent logic even between episodes. Spongebob. Multiple times, the show itself has called into question why they can have fire underwater. They questioned it directly when Patrick, of all people, flat out asked Spongebob, hey, if we're underwater, how can there be a fire? Well, he didn't get to say fire before it went out, but you, you know, you, you, you've seen the episode. And then, of course, the second time when Patchy the Pirate sent Spongebob an invitation underwater and the ink got all smeary, and Spongebob talked about the limitations of life underwater, and then immediately threw the letter into a fire. So multiple times, they've lampshaded the inconsistency in their own cartoon logic. But the cartoon that's probably the king of lampshading would be Phineas and Ferb. Probably the most notable would be the recurring joke where, you know, someone comes and asks Phineas and Ferb, Hey, aren't you a little young to be whatever they're doing that day? And then Phineas responds with, Yes, yes I am. 
As a show, Phineas and Ferb pretty much made a living off of playing with and subverting and averting and playing straight different tropes and just having fun with tropes in general. Sometimes it just felt like the show pretty much had no fourth wall. And if you're not sure what I mean by that, I'll probably cover that very related trope in episode 3. Shameless plug, man. Shameless. Absolutely. I'll see you guys next time. Hit that notification bell if you want to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. I mean, it'll just be a notification, but I mean, if, you, like, if your phone's on vibrate, then sure, it will tingle, I guess. So, do that. See you next week. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. As we said, we, as I said last time, this time we're going to be talking about breaking the fourth wall. TVTropes.org defines this as when a character acknowledges their fictionality by either indirectly or directly addressing the audience. They also might interact with the creator, that being the author or director or the artist of whatever work they're in. TV Tropes definition is a little more strict than a lot of other sources definition. For them, it only occurs when the character acknowledges the audience, whether it's indirectly or directly. Now, sort of by definition, a narrator has to break the fourth wall. Or a character like, if you remember him, Face on Nick Jr. He would directly talk to the audience between shows and tell you what's coming up next and things like that. Kids shows have a lot of this, really, from shows like Dora and Blue's Clues, where they directly talk to the kids in the audience to engage them. So in these shows, it's sort of done out of necessity. But probably most of the time in other shows and media is done for comedic effect. Probably my favorite example is from The Fresh Prince, when the family is talking about how rich they are, and then Will, sitting on the couch, says, We're so rich, why well, we can't afford no ceiling? And then they look up and see all the stage lights and stuff like that, and it's pretty funny. The Fresh Prince had a lot of different examples, like the one where Carlton is running around all the different set pieces from the episode and then runs in through the audience and goes all around and just entirely breaks the fourth wall. Or the other examples, which I guess are a little more subtle, like when Will says or sees something and then just looks at the camera for a second. And a ton, a ton of shows and movies have done things like this. There are plenty of times in Spongebob when they acknowledge the narrator. And speaking of Tom Kenny, the narrator in Powerpuff Girls a lot of times would acknowledge himself as the narrator and interact with the other characters and even got kidnapped by Mojo Jojo once. And Phineas and Ferb has a lot of moments where they break the fourth wall. They might acknowledge a commercial break or refer to certain characters as extras, and especially they like acknowledging their flashbacks and referring to them as such. And some other shows exist almost without a fourth wall, like take Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. Ned, at least in the beginning and end of the episode, will talk directly to the audience because the whole show is about him building a school survival guide for the audience. He doesn't really use it too much with the other characters, it, he doesn't really share it around there. He makes it for the audience. And there are many, many, many other examples I can give you. But, like always, I'll let you look up more on your own if you want. And also, my sinuses can only take so much talking right now. So, I will see you guys next time, next week, whatever that video is. Thanks for watching. Uh, hit this notification bell and let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. Hit the subscribe button if you want to. And whatever button YouTube has now. Whatever. Just hit, hit whatever. Like. Dislike. I don't care. They're both, they both work. See ya. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. And man, I've heard this one talked about a lot lately. What is a Mary Sue? What does it mean to refer to a character as that? Well, TVTropes.org doesn't really have a solid definition of it. Their summation of it is that it's generally used on a character who is important in the story, possesses unusual physical traits, and has an irrelevantly overskilled or over-idealized nature. In other words, this character is too strong, too powerful, too perfect, whatever it may be, for no or no good reason. A reason may be given, but it might either not make sense, or it might be an obvious cop-out. The name Mary Sue comes from a 1974 Star Trek parody fanfic. Male Mary Sue type characters are often referred to as Marty Stews or Gary Stews. And in the past year or so, I can think of three characters whose Mary Sue-ish qualities really got some people angry. First, Chloe on The Fairly Odd Parents. I haven't actually seen any episodes she's been in, but from what I gather, she's an overly perfect character. That is pretty much her character. And Timmy has to share Cosmo and Wanda with her, which flies in the face of pretty much everything that was established previously. So a troubled, bullied character has to share his only reward and escape from being a troubled, bullied character with someone who is neither of those things. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Second, I've seen a lot of anime fans get really upset over Khalifa in Dragon Ball Super. She pretty much got too strong too fast. They gave some explanations, but people didn't like him. That's about it. And then to end the year was one of the biggest examples, Rey in Star Wars, specifically in The Force Awakens and in The Last Jedi. Now, she was presented as very strong, and she didn't know why. In fact, it felt like it would be a plot point and something for the audience to discover with her. And she was getting a lot of cries of being a Mary Sue from the first movie. But a lot of other fans could overlook it because of how her character seemed to be set up for an explanation over time. But The Last Jedi went in a different direction and pretty much said, eh, forget about it. It doesn't matter. But her backstory does matter if you don't want her to be the Mary Sue that people complained about her being. It's like going up for an alley-oop and then coming down with the ball and deciding to reset the play. If you understand basketball, I guess. But on that, that's it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments. Is, is LeBron James a Marty Stu? Let me know. Okay. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys. Like, comment, subscribe, dislike. I don't care. Hit some button. Whatever. Bye. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. And you know what? I haven't talked to Discovery Channel about this, but I'm declaring it an early shark week. You may have heard of jumping the shark, but what does that mean? Well, TVTropes.org defines it as the moment when an established, long-running series changes in a significant manner in an attempt to stay fresh, and then that moment makes the viewers realize that the show is out of ideas. The attempt to stay relevant backfires. It's that moment when you look at a show and they do something that makes you say, okay, this is not the same show anymore. They are out of ideas, and I have no hope of them coming back from this. The term comes from an episode of Happy Days, in which Fonzie, leather jacket and all, jumped over a shark on water skis. Now, if you've never seen Happy Days, which is understandable, it started off as a rather grounded, relatable show set in the 1950s, with the main character being Richie Cunningham, played by Ron Howard post Andy Griffith show and pre-directing and being the father of Bryce Dallas Howard. The Fawn started off as a side character, but he blew up in popularity and was written more and more into the show. And that was a shift that was probably for the better, and it made things more interesting. But you know what happened later. In a season 5 episode, Fonzie jumped the shark. The ridiculousness of this was made even worse by the fact that, in a previous episode, the Fawns had done a motorcycle jump that left him seriously injured, and he decided it was really stupid for him to have done. So on top of the high level of absurdity, the stunt betrayed some previous character development that had already taken place. So that's the trope namer, but what about other examples? Well, honestly, it's a little too subjective for me to just give you examples and tell you that they are this. Like, you could say Family Matters jumped the shark when Urkel's science got to the point that he could turn himself into Stefan Raquel, or even later when he ended up doing all kinds of crazy science fiction kind of stuff. And since Fonzie's jumping the shark was such a famous scene, a lot of shows have jokingly and purposefully referenced it. For example, Sam and Cat had an episode where Sam wanted to jump over a tank full of killer tuna, and that whole event was just one big shout out to the Fonz. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, whatever other buttons there are. And thank you for watching. I just said that. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. I don't know why my voice is deeper than normal right now, but okay. What is a deus ex machina? Of course, we're going to tvtropes.org for the answer here. Literally, the term is Latin for God out of the machine, originating from ancient Greek theater scenes, where a crane would be used to lower actors or statues playing gods who would come into the story and fix the situation. Now, what does it mean today? Well, TV Tropes sets out four requirements for a plot development to be a deus ex machina. Number one, they are solutions to a problem, not something that makes the situation worse or some other sort of twist. Two, they are sudden or unexpected. It might be referenced or featured earlier, but it doesn't seem like a viable solution until it solves the problem. Number three, the situations they resolve are seen as unsolvable or hopeless. And number four, deus ex machina or external to the characters and their choices. That meaning that if it's a character that solves a problem, that character has had little to no influence on the plot until that moment. Or if it's an outside influence, it's up to random chance or something like that. So pretty much, oh no, what are we gonna do? Oh wait, we're saved! And that's it. And understandably, Deus Ex Machina are typically thought of pretty negatively, but some of the most popular and well-regarded movies in history have them. Think about the T-Rex at the end of Jurassic Park, who just shows up out of nowhere in the visitor center and eats up the raptors. There is no way for a T-Rex to sneak into a visitor center unnoticed. But most people let it go because, well, it's pretty cool. 
Or think about the end of The Wizard of Oz. The Scarecrow's on fire and Dorothy throws some water on him and accidentally puts the dot on the triple W. You get it? Because she's a she's she's the Wicked Witch of the West. It's three W's, like WW dot, and like a dot at the end, like a period, like punctuation, like finality. She she finished her. <laughs> but it's like, oh wow, oh no, I'm allergic to water or whatever. It makes me melt. And oh no, all these people who are protecting me are glad I'm gone, and they won't stop you guys from getting out of here. It's an iconic ending, but it's definitely a Deus Ex Machina. And then there's one of my favorite movies that I don't think is good, Spider-Man 3. Specifically, the part where Harry's butler, Bernard, reveals to him the truth about his father's death. And that leads, of course, to Harry turning around and being a good guy and helping out Spider-Man slash Peter in the final battle. So this guy who's been here saying nothing of importance for two and three quarters of a movie just out of nowhere shows up and says, The night your father died, I cleaned his wounds. The blade that pierced his body came from his glider. There's no question, your father died by his own hand. Then Harry's just like, oh, okay, cool, thanks for telling me. I'll I'll go help my best friend then. I kind of give up on this whole revenge thing I've had going on for the past few years while you've lived in this house not telling me anything. Okay, all right, thank you, bro. Personally, I prefer how Harry responded into how it should have ended, but we're talking about the actual movie here. And actually, no, we're not talking about anything because I'm done. Video is over. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, dislike even. And uh, see you next week. Whatever, whatever next week's video is. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. On today's menu, we have a MacGuffin. Not to be confused with a McDonald's breakfast item, TVTropes.org defines a MacGuffin, which can be spelled a variety of ways, as a term for a motivating element in a story that is used to drive the plot. It serves no further purpose. It won't pop up again. It won't explain the ending. It won't do anything except possibly distract you while you try to figure out its significance. In some cases, it won't even be shown. It is usually a mysterious package slash artifact slash super weapon that everyone in the story is chasing. Got it? Pretty much, a MacGuffin is the reason for the plot. It's what brings the characters together. It's what the characters are looking for. Now, I won't get too in-depth with the examples because pretty much, if you know what they are, then you'll probably understand. For some reason, the first one I think of is the Maltese Falcon in the movie The Maltese Falcon. Then you have the identity of Rosebud in Citizen Kane. You have the diamond Le Cure de la Mer, or the Heart of the Sea, in Titanic. You have Dorothy's ruby slippers in The Wizard of Oz. You have the Holy Grail in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And of course, you have Candace's Mary McGuffin doll in the episode Finding Mary McGuffin of Phineas and Ferb. Phineas and Ferb might as well be TV tropes the show. So yeah, all of these items are the driving point of the story that they're in, but it doesn't really matter what they are. They could kind of be replaced with any other item and it won't make a difference. And that's pretty much it. And Man, was this even shorter than normal? Well, since it is so short, I can tell you I do have a special video plan for when I hit 100 subscribers. It's actually done already, and I had a lot of fun making it. So hey, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and hit that button, and that video will come even sooner. Like, dislike, share, let me know what you think, anything. Just, just hit some buttons down there. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. You may have heard someone call a character an XP, but maybe you didn't know exactly what that meant. Well, according to TVTropes.org, an XP, which is short for an exported character, is a character who is clearly and deliberately based on another older character. There may be some differences in minor traits, but they are very clearly more or less one and the same. Oftentimes, both characters are by the same writer or production team. And this can be because of just writing tendencies, or it can be an attempt to bring back a character that wasn't too popular at first, but they want to try it again. Or when written by a different writer or team, it can be an homage to the older character or its creator. And like all tropes, this is not an exclusively bad thing. An XP can revitalize a character or at least a character type. Yogi Bear is an XP of Art Carney from The Honeymooners. Mickey Mouse is an XP of Felix the Cat. The Incredibles are pretty much the Fantastic Four, and still the best Fantastic Four movie. And Frozone is pretty much an XP of Iceman from X-Men. In Wreck-It Ralph, Ralph is an XP of Donkey Kong, and Fix-It Felix is an XP of Mario. Snoke and Kylo Ren are XPs of Palpatine and Darth Vader. The Flintstones are an XP to the Honeymooners, to the point that Jackie Gleason threatened to sue Hanna-Barbera. And Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are XPs of Batman and Robin and they were even voiced by Adam West and Burt Ward in a flashback episode. 
And of course, there are a whole bunch of other examples. And as always, I'll leave a TV Tropes link in the description. So thank you so much for watching. Please like or dislike. Share, comment, describe, describe, subscribe. You can describe it to somebody too, but send them the video. Subscribe though. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. We're going to chase down the meaning of yet another term today. What is a running gag? It sounds dangerous, like running with food in your mouth or something, and you, you trip and you know, something like that. But no. Well, according to TVTropes.org, a running gag is a joke whose humor derives from repetition, ideally becoming funnier each time it is repeated. It has to be repeated at least three times, otherwise it's a brick joke, which I'm probably going to cover in a different video. A running gag can be limited to just an episode, or it can be something that recurs throughout the entire series, or maybe a season. A pretty basic example of a running gag is a catchphrase. It's something a character is known for saying and they say it often, likely throughout an entire series. Now some examples. In the Star Wars franchise, there's a running gag of someone saying, I have a bad feeling about this, to the point that the Star Wars wiki has a whole page cataloging every appearance of the line. In iCarly, you have the running gag of anything Spencer works on catching fire randomly, or Gibby taking off his shirt, or Tebow selling something on a stick, and many others really. In Kenan and Kel, you have the running gag of at the beginning and end of episodes, Kenan asks Kel to go grab some random items, and it just frustrates Kel to the point where he says, Ah, here it goes, and then runs off stage. Or something goes wrong, and Kenan yells, Why? Or, of course, who loves orange soda? Cal loves orange soda. Is it true? Mm -hmm. I do, I do, I do. Ooh. I probably watched that show too much. And also you have pretty much everything in Phineas and Ferb. You have Jazz getting thrown out of the house in Fresh Prince. You have Ron losing his pants in a variety of ways on Kim Possible. Along with pretty much every villain always forgetting his name. Animaniacs have Hello Nurse and Mwah. Good night everybody. Hey Arnold has Brainy sneaking up behind Helga only to be punched by him, and Eugene getting hurt and saying, I'm okay. And that's a lot of examples. I'm doing a lot of voices right now. I might be going crazy. So thank you for watching. Please like or dislike this video, whichever one feels right. Leave a comment. Let me know what trope you want me to talk about next. And subscribe if you want more. Go check out my other videos. You know, see what else I do in here. See you next week. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Well, I mentioned it last time, might as well do it now, right? So, what is a brick joke? Well, like always, we'll go to tvtropes.org. The term is named after an old joke, which by the way, if you want to read it, I'll have it linked in the description. Well, essentially the joke feels like a combination of two jokes that aren't related at all. The first joke ends with the brick being discarded somehow and there's seemingly no punchline. And then at the end of the second joke, or maybe even the third joke, if you want to have an unrelated joke in the middle, the brick comes back and it's hilarious because you forgot about it. So pretty much you have a setup, then you have some other stuff that happens that takes your mind away from it, and then you have the payoff, which is even better because you weren't thinking about the setup. Now probably one of the most famous examples is the shawarma scene in Avengers. See earlier on in the movie Tony suggests that they go to the shawarma place, and I don't think anybody took that to be a particularly noteworthy line, right? And then if you're paying attention, you can see the place almost getting destroyed during the battle. And then at the very end of the movie, in the second stinger, you see them all there at the swarmer place just eating. So you know, on top of other things, like, you know, this being the culmination of all these movies coming together, you think, oh hey, they actually went there. And while we're on the Avengers, in Age of Ultron, you have the scene where Vision just effortlessly picks up Thor's hammer after the scene earlier when everybody tried to pick it up and failed. In The Incredibles, Syndrome's demise could be considered a brick joke, set up by Edna's No Capes rant. But brick jokes don't have to be confined to just one movie or series. In The Lion King, Zazu says that Scar would make a very handsome throw rug. And then three years later, in Hercules, you see a throw rug that is very clearly Scar. And then you have one of the most straightforward examples. In the Spongebob episode, The Two Faces of Squidward. Early on in the episode, handsome Squidward is just so handsome that he causes a fish to fly. And that fish loses his shoe in mid-air, or mid-water. And then at the end of the episode, that shoe comes crashing through the roof of the Krusty Krab. And that causes Spongebob to push Squidward out of the way of the shoe. And Squidward dramatically goes flying into a pole face first, which changes his face back to normal. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of other examples. Phineas and Ferb has his own page worth of examples, because of course it does. But I'll let you guys look up more examples if you want to. 
Thank you so much for watching. Please like or dislike, comment, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. See you guys next week. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. This is a pretty common term that you've probably heard before. What is a retcon? Well, of course, we're going to tvtropes.org for some answers. Well, to begin with, retcon is short for retroactive continuity. It's when you reframe an event from the past to fit better with the current story. Ideally, it doesn't contradict anything from the past, and it clarifies a question without adding more questions on top of it. But of course, not every example is ideal. In fact, from my observation, retcons seem to be thought of more negatively than positively or even neutrally. But of course, there's examples from all over the place. The first one I always think of is Spider-Man 3 making Sandman the actual killer of Uncle Ben. And it was an accident during a gentle carjacking? Incompossible. Although it was never mentioned, Shigo's Plasma Hands ability was originally and officially just from her high-tech gloves. But later on, she was just made superhuman. She was shown using her powers barehanded and even came from a whole superhero family. And there are even examples from real life. In sports, titles and championships can be taken away after the fact in cases where it comes to light that there was cheating or violations taking place. For example, you have Lance Armstrong being stripped of his titles after it was found that he had been doping. The NCAA had all of Penn State football's wins from 1998 to 2011 stripped from the record books after their child abuse scandal, even though this was eventually reversed. The Louisville men's basketball team lost 123 wins from 2011 to 2015, including a national championship in 2013. And of course, in 2006, we retconned a planet. Pluto was considered the ninth planet in the solar system, but there were just too many objects of a similar size and even bigger than Pluto that had been found and declared too small to be considered planets. So even though many people still thought of and think of Pluto as a planet in their hearts, that classification just had to be retconned away. And as may be obvious, there's a whole bunch of other examples. I mean, I ended up talking about planets. So I'll leave a link to the main TV Tropes article in the description if I don't forget, because I kind of tend to forget until like an hour later. So you can see all the other things in fact and fiction that have been retconned away. Well, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you like it or dislike it if you dislike it. Be honest with yourself. Leave a comment. Let me know what retcons you remember or bother you or maybe ones you like. And if you're not subscribed, maybe it's time for a retcon, right? See you next week. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. Today we're looking somewhat nervously at the Uncanny Valley. Maybe you've heard of it, but what is it? As always, we're going to tvtropes.org for some answers. Well, the Uncanny Valley was hypothesized in 1970 by Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori, suggesting that the more human-like a robot gets, the more endearing it is to humans until a certain point where the affinity for it just dips. He compares the graph version of his hypothesis to a hiker climbing up a hill until he reaches a valley, which he deemed the uncanny valley. And when a likeness reaches the uncanny valley, the reaction is often strongly negative, often but not always finding the result to be creepy or scary. But of course, this doesn't just apply to robotics, but also TV, movies, and even sound. For example, the uneasiness that a lot of people feel when they hear backwards speaking can be attributed to the Uncanny Valley. Shaman and Nero. Excuse me. Also in animation, the humans and even animals in Toy Story can really fall into this. That 90s CGI really looks a lot better on the toys than it does on the humans. And then you have the far too human-like faces on the characters in Shark Tale. Or in other movies like Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Pretty, pretty much like almost all the characters. Or Thing 1 and Thing 2 in the live action Cat in the Hat. Or Princess Leia in Rogue One. Or on TV you have the flashback scenes in George Lopez. Or a lot of the characters on Lazy Town. Or Balloony from Phineas and Ferb. Or I'd even say the baby head too. Or just like all of Angela Anaconda. And then of course those famous scenes in Courage the Cowardly Dog. And then you have things like dolls and clowns. A lot of people's fear of these things can be attributed to them falling into the uncanny valley. But really it's all subjective, like not everybody's going to agree on every example. But let me know which examples fit the most for you. Which examples just hit you just wrong. Thank you so much for watching, please like, comment, subscribe, share, whatnot, all those things. Hit the buttons. I'll see you next week. 
Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Here's a fun one. What is a cloud cuckoo lander? As always, we're going to tvtropes.org for the answer. And there we find that a cloud cuckoo lander is a character with their head in the clouds. They might be oblivious to common knowledge. They might argue with themselves for fun. They may make accidental double entendres. They are very rarely malicious. 90% of the time you just think they're crazy, but the other 10% they seem like the only sane person around. And if this all sounds familiar to you, it's because there's a whole bunch of examples. Like for one, Unikitty, who in the Lego movie is the ruler of Cloud Cuckoo Land. Uh, that's pretty direct. Then you have some examples that you might not immediately think of, like Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Because to us, she doesn't seem too much like a Cloud Cuckoo Lander, but to the townspeople, she definitely does. Then for more classic examples, uh, I'm gonna go kinda fast on this. You have Agnes from Despicable Me, Kronk from The Emperor's New Groove, Dory from Finding Nemo and Finding Dory, you know, Dory. Dory. Lilo in a lot of ways from Lilo and Stitch, King Julian from Madagascar and all other stuff he's in related to Madagascar, Sheen from Jimmy Neutron and Planet Sheen, let's not talk about Planet Sheen, Richard and Sussy from Gumball, all three of Yakko, Wacko, and Dot from Animaniacs, Number three from Codename Kids Next Door, Daffy Duck from You better know where Daffy Duck's from. Cosmo and Crocker from Fairly Odd Parents, Freakazoid from Freakazoid, Mabel from Gravity Falls, Grandma Gertie from Hey Arnold, Gur and probably Zim from Invader Zim, my dude Ron Stoppable from Kim Possible, Lola Bunny and the Looney Tunes Show, Pinkie Pie from My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, KO from OKKO, OK Pinky from Pinky in the Brain, SpongeBob and Patrick from You Know Where They're From. Michelangelo in pretty much all the Ninja Turtles cartoons, Starfire in Teen Titans, Tigger, Topanga at first in Boy Meets World, then Eric later, Phoebe from Friends, Kel from Keenan and Kel, Reese, Dewey, and Hal from Malcolm in the Middle, Brick from The Middle, and of course, Cat Valentine from Victorious and Sam and Cat. Am I yelling? Well, I think you can see the through line with all these characters and why they're all residents of Cloud Cuckoo Land. Well, if you want more information and more examples, feel free to go over to tvtropes.org. I'll put the link in the description if I remember. I, I kind of tend to forget, but I'll remember eventually. Thank you so much for watching. Please like or dislike this video, depending on how you feel. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to me. Subscribe if you're new. Hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. Let me know in the comments what other tropes you might want me to cover and what other videos you want to see from me. Check out the My Favorite Tropes playlist and see what I've already covered. And, I don't, I don't know, share, I guess. I guess share. Why not? Okay. I'll see you next week. Probably. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV. Today we have a request. And by the way, you can always request other tropes or other video topics that you want to see me cover. I might not always be able to do it, but hey, feel free to ask. So, what is an ink suit actor? Well, of course, we're going to tvtropes.org for our answer. And there we read, rather simply, that an ink suit actor is a famous actor whose animated counterpart is essentially the actor themselves. Actors playing themselves or characters clearly like themselves is not very unusual, but it is much more so in animation. Examples? This might go kind of fast. In something of a pioneering example, the genie from Aladdin is essentially just Big Blue Robin Williams. Phil in Hercules is clearly just Danny DeVito. Cobra Bubbles in Lilo and Stitch is very much just Bing Rames. Mushu and Donkey in Mulan and Shrek, respectively, are just animated Eddie Murphy. Princess Fiona in Shrek is pretty much just Cameron Diaz in her human form. And Fiona's human form, I guess. I mean, both of their human All four main characters in Wreck-It Ralph oh. are pretty much just yeah. their voice actors. Okay, yeah, sure, just cut me off. Poe, Kung Fu Panda is just Panda Jack Black. Most of the characters in Shark Tale... <laughs> to terrifying effect. Chip Sky... Shark Tale's still in my head. Chip Skylark of Fairly Odd Parents is very much just his actor, Chris Kirkpatrick of NSYNC. Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy and SpongeBob are very much their actors, Ernest Borgnine and Tim Conway. And then, of course, Adam West, to the point that Adam Westing is his own trope. And he's played either himself or characters clearly based off of himself in <laughs> a whole bunch of stuff. Fairly Odd Parents, Family Guy, Kim Possible, Batman the Animated Series, The Simpsons, Johnny Bravo, SpongeBob. He dove headfirst into playing himself. And well, that's it. If you want to read more, feel free to head over to the TV Tropes page that I'll try to remember to put in the description. Thanks again for the request, and thank you so much for watching. Please like this video or dislike it if you dislike it. Be honest with yourself. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense single when I upload. I'll try to see you next week. 
Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. You probably know what this one is already, but it was suggested in the comments, and I think it was a great suggestion. What is a creator cameo? Of course, and as always, we're going to tvtropes.org for our answer. And there we find that it's when a franchise's creator or a project's producer or director appears in the franchise itself. Pretty straightforward, but how about some examples? For one, there's Stan Lee in Spider-Man, and Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 3, and The Amazing Spider-Man, and The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man Homecoming, and Spider-Man PS4, and Spider-Man The Animated Series, and Spectacular Spider-Man, and Ultimate Spider-Man, and Into the Spider-Verse. Okay, sure, that's Stan Lee, but what about Stan Lee in Iron Man, and Iron Man 2, and Iron Man 3, and Thor, and Thor The Dark World? and Thor Ragnarok, and The Incredible Hulk, what about that, yeah, yeah, okay. And pretty much everything. He was in Phineas and Ferb Mission Marvel. He was even in How It Should Have Ended. He was in stuff he didn't even create, like Teen Titans Go to the movies, and stuff that's not even comic book related like The Simpsons. I think you get the gist. And I can list plenty of other examples from other people who were not Stan Lee, but eh, this is a Stan Lee video. Well, thank you so much for watching, hit all the buttons, let me know in the comments, what was your favorite Stan Lee cameo? Mine was probably The Amazing Spider-Man. That one's so good. I'll see you next week. Wait. See you tomorrow. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. New font, new intro, sort of like a sequel to my old intro, really. Brilliant segue. What is sequelitis? As always, we're going to tvtropes.org for our answer. I should just copy and paste that line into every tropes video so I don't have to keep saying it. Sequelitis essentially is the idea that with each sequel in a series, there is an increased probability that the sequel will be terrible. The exception is that the first sequel is usually either great or mediocre. Some symptoms of sequelitis include, for one, making a sequel purely for the monetary potential and not the creative potential, or when a character in the series returns in a really contrived way, or when a character is replaced with a cheaper actor, and not just because the previous actor is busy or grew up or something like that, or retcons that upset the fan base, or a lot of other ones that you can read on your own through the link in the description. So examples, right? Right. This is another video where the examples might go fast, so <clears throat> let's go. Most directed video sequels like Pocahontas 2 and The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2, and, sorry I took French, and Mulan 2 and a lot of Disney 2s. The Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy is pretty interesting because the second one is generally regarded as the best, but then 3 is not, even if I still love it. There's been a lot of up and down with the X-Men movies, even though I've barely seen any of them, sue me. And then you have the Superman movies, specifically when you get to Superman 3 and Superman 4. The Jaws movies has some pretty intense sequelitis from Jaws to Jaws 2 to Jaws 3D to Jaws the Revenge. The Jurassic Park franchise is pretty interesting, with the first three generally being considered a step down from each other, and then Jurassic World being sort of more split opinion-wise, and then Jurassic World The Fallen Kingdom being thought of more as going back down again. And then the Star Wars franchise could take forever to try to unravel with this. You got prequelitis here, it's, it's sort of a mess, especially since there's so many new ones that just... <sighs> Yeah. and yeah. Uh, Dragon Ball GT, what am I doing? And then there's Star Trek after the next generation, and that 80s show, why not? And of course, there's so many other examples, and as I already said, you can go to the original article in the link in the description and see all the other examples too, and read up even more about it, because these are really quick videos. This is gonna be, what, like two and a half minutes? Maybe three, you know, intro, outro, okay, yeah. Like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, be honest with me and with yourself, come on. Let me know what else you want to see. I'm always open to suggestions. And again, subscribe. Hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. See you next week. For real this time, I think. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. What is a bottle episode? Well, as we always do, let's go to tvtropes.org for the answer. Essentially, a bottle episode is one that is designed to be as inexpensive as possible. And generally, the easiest and most common way of going about this is just using the regular cast and putting them in one location. No guest stars, no background characters, no new sets. 
just the regular cast, possibly in a more character driven episode or maybe a reminiscing sort of clip show episode. And while single location episodes are the most commonly thought of when you think of this, the only real requirement to be a bottle episode is that it saves on cost, with the money having to pass through a proverbial bottleneck. And speaking of bottles, the Star Trek cast and crew refers to this type of episode as a ship in a bottle episode, which is where the trope name comes from. Examples, which may or may not be specific depending on how much I know or care about specific episodes of the show. Friends, for instance, had a number of them, especially in season 1. Saved by the Bell had a lot of them, also especially in season 1. Which makes sense because first seasons tend to have lower budgets than the rest of the show. Star Trek, as implied earlier, was something of a pioneer in this area, continuing from the original series onward. But bottle episodes are not limited to live action. Like for one, Spongebob has had a number of them, from Gary Takes a Bath, to Truth or Square, to Reef Blower with literally no recorded dialogue, and Big Sister Sam with literally one real background, and then of course again a whole bunch of season 1 episodes. The Powerpuff Girls had the Powerpuff Girls best rainy day adventure ever, where they're stuck inside the house. Phineas and Ferb had Blackout, which was mostly a black background and eyeballs. Or you can go to the Looney Tunes, where every Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner short was just those two characters except for one, and set in the desert. And of course there's a whole lot of other examples, Invader Zim, Family Guy, some video games. And the link will be in the description for you to check out the rest of them. So thank you for watching, subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. Like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, be honest with yourself. And tell me what other tropes you want to see me cover. I'll try to see you next week. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. With the Disney Fox deal officially official, here's something some people might be worried about. Disneyfication. What is that? Well, of course, as always, we're going to tvtropes.org for our answer. Essentially, it's making a story kid safe or parent approved by taking out certain plot elements, even if they're historically correct, or adding Broadway-style musical numbers, or making the ending more happily ever after-ish, or making the distinction between good and evil clearer, or, well, all of the above. And even though this is often thought of sort of negatively, it's not always a bad thing. Disneyfication can make stories just more easy to digest, or more fleshed out. It's given us our standard visual representation for characters and stories like Snow White and The Little Mermaid. And funny enough, despite the name, the Brothers Grimm were doing this way before Disney was a thing. So for some examples, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves takes out two of the Queen's attempts at killing Snow White and changes the Queen's demise from being exposed and burned alive to being taken care of by nature. You know, lightning and a boulder and a cliff and stuff, but still by nature and not by the heroes themselves. Bambi's mom's death, as much as it probably scarred all of us, is much lighter in the movie than it is in the original book. Nor do they have his cousin Gobo's death, or the fact that Feline was his cousin. Eh, animals. The Little Mermaid ends with Ariel not dead, and gives Ursula, for one, a name, and two, an actual evil personality as opposed to a neutral one in the original story. The Hunchback of Notre Dame changes a whole lot. Pocahontas changes a whole lot. The Lion King lightens up a whole lot if you compare it to Hamlet. And funny enough, in an attempt to avoid this with Star Wars, Disney doesn't show their logos before their Star Wars movies, and like them or not, they haven't really been Disney-fied. And of course there are non-Disney examples, like Tom and Jerry in the Tom and Jerry movie became friends, the Swan Princess adds a happy ending in Talking Animals to Swan Lake, the Wizard of Oz takes out a whole lot of violence, and well, there's of course a lot of examples. And of course I'll link to TV tropes in the description. And funny enough, there's no real Marvel examples in there, but guess what? April's gonna be Marvel Month here on Speeder TV. Nothing but Marvel as we get ready for Avengers Endgame and celebrate 200 subscribers. So, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. Like the video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, and I will see you next week. Welcome back to My Favorite Tropes on Speeder TV, and welcome back to Marvel Month on Speeder TV. I've covered retcons before on here, but what is retcanon? Well, of course, we're going to tvtropes.org for our answer. 
And there we find that retcanon is when elements of an adaptation, or even the whole adaptation, are added to the canon of the original source material. So say, there's a comic book made and then there's a movie made about the comic book, but the movie adds an element to the story. And that element is so well liked or fits so well that the comic then in turn adds that to its own story. And well, since it's Marvel month, here's some Marvel examples. After Black Panther, comics have depicted Eric Kellmonger closer to the aesthetic of Michael B. Jordan's portrayal, both with facial hair and with his ritual scars. And similarly, Okoye has gone from having long hair to matching her movie appearance with a shaved and tattooed head. Tony Stark's personality in the comics has shifted more to match Robert Downey Jr.'s portrayal, snarkier and more comedic than he had been previously. The Hulk's famous catchphrase, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, didn't originate from the comics, but from the 70s TV show. In 2005, Spider-Man was given organic webbing, much like in the Raimi movies, that being his ability to shoot webs just from his body and not with web shooters. Also, the symbiote suit didn't affect his personality originally in the comics, but that idea came from the 90s cartoon. Guardians of the Galaxy had a storyline where Groot was shrunken down to match baby Groot in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2. And they've also been using the phrase Infinity Stones instead of Infinity Gems, matching the movies. And of course, there's plenty of other examples, more Marvel, DC, Disney, Power Rangers, all kinds of stuff. Of course, I'll put the link to the article in the description below. Thank you so much for watching, like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, be honest with yourself, subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense single when I upload, and I will see you next week. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Today we have a suggestion from my Instagram. And if you'd like to make a suggestion, that would be a great way to do it at Speeder TV underscore YT. So what is a Captain Ursatz? Well, as always, we're going to TVTropes.org for the answer. Essentially, this is the result of when a creator wants to use a certain character or property, but they can't, often for legal reasons. So they just create a carbon copy. Now, if this sounds kind of familiar, it's pretty similar to an XB, which I covered over a year ago, jeez. I, I just watched that video, I had so much less energy back then. But the difference between a Captain Ersatz and an XB is that an XB isn't intended to really be that original character. Heavily influenced by and a large reference to, sure, but a Captain Ersatz is essentially that character just with a different name. Like if I created a character who fought crime dressed as a bat, brooding over buildings and grieving over his dead parents, and he said, hi. I'm Carl. That's not Batman, that's a Captain Ersatz of him. It's Carl. So for some actual examples, in Megamind, Metro Man is a Captain Ersatz of Superman. And Megamind himself is one of Brainiac and Lex Luthor combined. Roxanne is one of Lois Lane and Hal is one of Jimmy Olsen. Captain Marvel, the Shazam one, is a Captain Ersatz of Superman. Which is kind of funny because he would eventually become a DC character like Superman is, but he wasn't originally. Deadpool, you know, Wade Wilson, was originally a Captain Ersatz of Deathstroke, Slade Wilson. Warner Brothers has a character named Foxy, who's a Captain Ersatz of... I mean, look at him. But then Mickey is really a Captain Ersatz of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. But then Oswald's really a Captain Ersatz of Felix the Cat. And then there's some other ones like Dark Laser and Catman on Fairly Odd Parents. Some characters can be argued to be either Captain Ersatzes or XBs, like The Incredibles are of the Fantastic Four, and Dash is of The Flash, or Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are of Batman and Robin. And of course, there's so many other examples, and I will leave the link in the description below for you to check them out yourself. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it. Remember, comments, Twitter, Instagram if you want to contact me. Plus, now I have a Patreon and Teespring. So check those out, and I should most likely see you next week. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Today's trope was a suggestion, and if you'd like to make a suggestion, leave your suggestion in the comments. Or you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram and talk to me there. Or if you want a more guaranteed request for a trope or really any other video topic, you can join my Patreon. And also, Teespring if you want shirts and stuff, because I'm apparently plugging everything I have. But hey, there's no harm in a little promo, and no celebrities were harmed is the trope we're talking about today. But what does it mean? Well, of course, as always, we're going to TVTropes.org for our answer. And there we see that this is the case when you have a character who is, as the page says, a thinly disguised imitation of a celebrity. It can be an homage or a parody. It can be to make a point. It could even just be because it would be a cool idea. 
but often it is seen as a sign that the writers may be out of ideas. And it also runs the risk of dating your piece, as celebrities are only so relevant for so long. And this is pretty similar to an XB and a Captain Ersatz, both of which I've covered already, with the difference being that those two are both imitations of fictional characters, where this is imitations of real-life celebrities. It's also different from an ink suit actor, which I've also covered before, where in that case, an actor is playing a caricature of themselves. So for some examples, of which there are many, and I will say relatively few. Edna Mode from The Incredibles is heavily based off of costume designer Edith Head. And Evelyn Dever from Incredibles 2 is largely based off of performance artist Laurie Anderson. The Vultures in The Jungle Book are based off of The Beatles, as you might notice, though their musical number is not Beatles-esque because Walt Disney didn't think the Beatles' music would have staying power. Supposedly. The Ross family on Jesse is clearly based on Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie's multicultural trail mix of a family. And of course, The Sweet Life at London Tipton, very clearly based off of Paris Hilton. The Brain of Animaniacs and Peaking in the Brain was based largely off of Maurice LaMarche having a great Orson Welles impression. And speaking of the Animaniacs, Yakko is very much based on Groucho Marx in a lot of ways, and Wacko is pretty much just Ringo Starr. Johnny Bravo is very much based off of Elvis Presley, and Elvis is a pretty popular celebrity to imitate, much like Britney Spears with characters like Ginger Fox on iCarly, or Britney Britney in The Fairly Odd Parents, or Cross with Christina Aguilera in Britina in Impossible. And then of course Arnold Schwarzenegger with characters like Jorgen von Strangle on Fairly Odd Parents, and you know, others. There's a lot of others, and feel free to bring up some of the others in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching, <laughs> like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, I feel out of practice here. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. I want to say I'll see you next week, but I don't trust myself, so bye. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Today's trope was yet another suggestion from the comments, and if you'd like to leave a suggestion, leave a comment. And if you'd like to make a more official request, go head over to my Patreon. Now the trope is pretty straightforward and there's a lot of examples, so why waste time outside of artificially inflating my watch time? What is a seldom seen species? Well of course, as we always do, we're going to head over to tvtropes.org for our answer. And there we find that a seldom seen species is a species that you seldomly see. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. A species that you see and you think, hey, I don't usually see that. Like for instance, the Geico Gecko. How many gecko characters do you typically see? Aladdin has Abu, who's a brown spider monkey, and Iago, who's a red macaw. The Lion King has a whole bunch, as you'd probably expect, but most prominently there's Timon, who's a meerkat. Finding Nemo showcases a lot of fish that aren't typically seen often, but especially the clownfish and the blue tang. Clan. Madagascar gives us three types of lemurs, the ring-tailed lemur, the mouse lemur, and the eye eye. Animaniacs gives us Minerva Mink, Arthur gives us Arthur, who's an aardvark. Lola from Cat Dog is a whippoorwill. On Craig of the Creek, Mortimer is a budgerigar. Looney Tunes gives us both Tasmanian Devil and Roadrunner, who are the things that their names are. Phineas and Ferb gives us a lot of them, but especially Perry the Platypus. Mordecai from Regular Show is the relatively seldom seen Blue Jay. Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life is a wallaby. Spongebob gives us a lot, but there's especially Spongebob Squarepants, a seldom seen species of a sea sponge, and Jesse had Mrs. Kipling, an Asian water monitor. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other examples, and it's worth noting that which species are really seldom seen for you can vary depending on your location. And of course, I'll have a link to the original TV Tropes article in the description. I just hit my mouth on the microphone, so I should leave. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell, let your Peter sends tinkle when I upload too many S's. I'll hopefully see you next week. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Here's a pretty well known one. What is a cliffhanger? Well, as we always do, we'll go to tvtropes.org for our answer. And there we find that a cliffhanger is when an ending consists of characters being in peril or there being some sort of shocking revelation. It's the kind of ending that may end with to be continued. One way or another, the audience has to wait for its resolution. The name comes from old film serials where a character would at the end be left hanging off a cliff, the escape being revealed next time. Now a cliffhanger at the end of a season can be very dangerous because you might not know if you're coming back next season. You get cancelled, you might be on that cliff forever. Now for some examples. 
The Empire Strikes Back ends with Han Solo being captured and frozen in carbonite to be rescued in the next movie, Return of the Jedi. The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 ends with Katniss visiting the captured PETA, who is, who is, who is messed up. Uh, late spoiler alert for like everything on here, by the way. The 60s Batman series would regularly end with a cliffhanger for the viewer to come back next week, same bat time, same bat channel, for a resolution that's just super easy, barely an inconvenience. Season 5 of Wormy's World ends with Cory proposing to Popanga during their graduation ceremony. Friends ended almost every season with a cliffhanger. Chapter slash episode 7 of The Mandalorian season 1 ended with a cliffhanger, which will presumably be resolved hours before this video goes up. Just about every episode of Rocky and Bullwinkle ends with a cliffhanger. Hey Arnold ended dangling both what happened to Arnold's parents and his response to Helga's declaration of her love, finally. A cliffhanger so burning that they were finally able to resolve it 13 years later with the Jungle movie. The sixth and final season of Gumball ends in a literal cliffhanger, which I still haven't seen, actually. And Spider-Man the Animated Series ends with Spider-Man not finding Mary Jane. It just ended, much like this video. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense think of when I upload. Like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it. The socials and Patreon and Teespring are on the screen right now. Follow there if you want. Do do stuff, you know. And I will see you in the <coughs> What's become of our tune trope tuber? Is this ending just to reinforce the point? Will the next video actually be on time? Find out next week, hopefully. Same time, I think. Same channel. Definitely same channel. Welcome back to my favorite tropes in Speeder TV. Now this one may be a little self-explanatory, but it's so common, so let's ask. What makes a character adorkable? Well, as we always do, we'll go to tvtropes.org for our answer. And well, essentially, it's when a character is dorky in some way, but adorably so. Again, it's pretty straightforward. But then, these characters are usually male, though of course not always, and they're pretty relatable because they're not over the top, and everybody can relate to being awkward. Now, with such a common trope, I'm going to give a whole bunch of examples and say them really fast and hate myself when I'm editing. Peter Parker. Just, just, just every Peter Parker. Barry Allen Flash tends to be rather adorable. Goku, Gohan, and Goten all tend to be rather adorkable. Hiro, Baymax, and most of the characters from Big Hero 6 would qualify. Max and Roxanne from a Goofy movie, totally adorkable. And, I mean, Goofy too. Hiccup, adorkable. Hogarth, adorkable. Ariel, adorkable. With a fork. The Hulk. Okay, well, Mark Ruffalo as Bruce Banner, adorkable. Urkel, yes. Carlson, you bet. Riley Matthews, yes. Corey Matthews. Not even on the page, but I say yes. Even Sporticus. More like a dork kiss. Sorry. Jimmy Neutron. And Carl. And Sheen. Dexter. A dorkable laboratory. Lilo. You know. Phineas and Ferb. Indubitably. Milo Murphy. Yeah. Ron Unstoppable. Booyah. And of course, likely, you. Anybody watching this video. You're not listening on the page either, but this is my video. And thank you so much for watching my video. Like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense think when I upload. Instagram, Twitter on the screen right now. Patreon, Teespring right there too. And hopefully I will see you next week. Hey, wash your hands. Welcome back to my favorite tropes on Speeder TV. Today we have yet another one you've probably heard of. What is Chekhov's gun? As always, we'll go to tvtropes.org for our answer. Well, in the words of Russian short story writer and trope namer Anton Pavlovich Chekhov, if you say in the first chapter that there is a rifle hanging on the wall, in the second or third chapter it absolutely must go off. If it's not going to be fired, it shouldn't be hanging there. Essentially, if it's not an important detail, don't write it. But over time, we've come to use the term to describe an object that at first is unimportant, but then later becomes important. More or less synonymous with foreshadowing. If you want some examples, you have to promise me you're going to wash your hands when I'm done. 20 second outro, do it then, it's perfect. Now, this can be an object or a setup. Like for instance, in Big Hero 6. It's set up early on that Baymax can only cease function when you say, I am satisfied with my care. 
and that comes into play later when spoiler stuff happens, I guess. Spoiler warning for stuff? I don't know. The Incredibles has a number of them, including Buddy himself, who at first is just an obsessive little fanboy, but who grows up to become the obsessive villain Syndrome. Edna Mode's No Capes rant sets up Syndrome's later cape jet engine death, and even Bob and Dash playing football earlier sets up Bob having to throw the remote to Dash later. In The Lion King, Nala wins two play fights early with Simba by pinning him down, and later when they meet as adults she does the same thing and that's what helps him recognize her, and then he uses the same move later in his fight with Scar. Finding Nemo has a number of them, from the all drains lead to the ocean setup, to the setup of the minefield around Bruce's boat. In The Amazing Spider-Man, if you remember that movie like I do, Dr. Connors points out the Gnolly device to Peter, saying that it's just been sitting there gathering dust, and then later as the lizard is what he uses to spread the serum around New York, and then what Spider-Man uses to spread the antidote. And then speaking of Spider-Man, as I often am, in Homecoming we're introduced to the Iron Spider suit that he would later wear in Avengers Infinity War, and also we were introduced to his suit's instant kill mode which he would later use in Endgame. In the second to last episode of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, the family takes a trip on the SS Tipton, which is where the kids and many of the characters would then be for The Sweet Life on deck. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other examples, which you can read in the link in the description below. I link to the page every time for these. Thank you so much for watching. Like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, be honest with yourself and with me. Subscribe if you're new, hit the notification bell to let your speeder sense tingle when I upload. Teespring, Patreon, Twitter, Instagram, all on the screen right now and in the description, I think. And remember, the outro music is 20 seconds. You can wash your hands for that one. See you next something.